Here we are with our weekly Annie News content for Mushoku Tensei episode, whatever it was, season two cut content. Give it to me. There's certain things Mushoku Tensei just can't adapt in the anime, and one of them was unfortunately like Rydius's Demonic Circle of Six. This what? Demonic Circle of Six? The fuck are we talking? Teleportation stuff? This is just one of the many school life topics the anime brushes to the side, and it joins the likes of Rudy's nightlife and even some of his daily life. You mean the demonic circle of six involves his erectile function now? They're the subtle moments which bring this world to life, and they often expand the story beyond that of just Rudy's. Okay. This time it just so happens to be a shonen subplot happening in the background, and I figured some of you might be interested in hearing about it. I'm actually interested, Nenemushi but before- also had a oh. major impact in this episode. I'm, I'm feeling the ad about to come up, but before we get into that, here's the word from our sponsor of the video. Too, so as we look at that and the true extent it's coming, of it's coming. affected Rudy, Hopefully you'll appreciate more this subtle piece while, you know, we still have it. But first, Web Novel's back again to sponsor this video with yet another- Classic! You know what to do. Use your discount code and in youth to get your first 10 pulls off of- Well, this is not a gacha game. This is just Web Novel. How does he get all these fucking different sponsorships, man? Is it an affiliate link? Maybe I should reach out to Web Novel. Anyways, back to the main content. I know the anime's been pretty heavy with all the slice of life stuff lately, but you'd be surprised to know that there could have been a whole lot more. I mean, you may not notice it with the way the anime portrays it, but the passage of time has been rather quick lately. Has it? From when season 3 started to where we are now, it's been almost half a year and things have been relatively okay. peaceful. Of course, the novel isn't going to write about each of those days in detail, but it did spend an entire chapter describing one of them. Holy fucking shit. So this is the light novel, huh? Very wordy. I mean, what do you expect? It's a fucking novel, man. Them. Then wait, wait, wait. I read something here that says Orsted. Just so you know, if you lay a hand on me, I'll go crying to Orsted. <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> Orsted mentioned. Then even in this most recent episode with Nanahoshi, you wouldn't have been able to tell due to how quickly everything happened, Julie's but so cute. two months have passed since Rudy and Sylvie were married, another several days from when the letter came, a month after that for the incident with Nanahoshi, then even an entire week for when Nanahoshi was living at their house. Damn, the pacing. One more week would be spent finally getting to the successful experiment, so in the span of one episode, this was three and a half months that had gone by. It's a progression of time that I feel needs to be mentioned, since it helps to make sense of why things happen so fast in the anime. Now, when did they fuck? And has it been nine months? Now, Sophie did talk about how it's hard for elves to, you know, actually conceive a baby. But still kind of keeping that in the back of my mind. Because everything seems to be setting up for, like, the happiest Rudy's has ever been. Reunited with family. Married. Dick works. Everything is so happy. Oh, Sophie's pregnant too? Oh, so happy. And then everything just comes crumbling down is what I'm waiting for. Unless you were aware of the months that had passed, you'd probably think this all took place over a week or something. Now, to briefly mention some key events from that day in the life chapter, mornings were often spent training with Bodyguardi. He would spectate or spar depending on the day, then occasionally join for breakfast really? and leave straight after. Oh, I thought Bodyguardi was just like watching us swing the sword every morning for no reason, because that's what the anime shows. He's just like standing to the side and just go like, hmm. Hmm, as we just swinged it, but we were actually getting training with them, huh? He would spectate or spar depending on the day, then occasionally spectate join for breakfast or spar. and leave straight after. Rudy would then head to school to check up on Cliff and Xanaba, and it was both their research that we would get an update on. Cliff was in the middle of creating his own magical instrument, so if his theory was right, then it was very possible to create one capable of negating curses. As magical instrument? A magical instrument that helps you negate the curse? It inferred that magical items and curses functioned the same. You see... Right, we were talking about how there's like a second layer of a magical circle that may be attributing to the doll and how it was moving before. And somehow this connects to how he could figure out Eden Arise's curse. If a curse placed on an object produced a magic item and a curse placed on a person made them a cursed child, the fundamental properties of wait 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 curse placed on a person functioned the same. You see, if a curse placed on an object produced a magic item and a curse placed on a person made them a cursed child, okay. The fundamental properties of their origin seemed very similar. Reverse engineering, this okay. Cliff think that if something could be done about the effects of a magic item, then the same could be said for the effects of a curse. 
It was the basis behind his knowledge of magic circles in general, and a solid explanation for why he was so well versed in it later. Zanaba was doing his research on the doll, and the majority of that consisted of deciphering the journal they'd found. It was a lofty task he spent most of his day on, and this left Julie to do work on her own stuff. Julie is always so cute. Since Julie was bought, and her progress with earth magic was actually quite astonishing. Okay. In fact, if she continued practicing with the daily lessons Rudy provided for her, then Rudy knew she'd be an expert at it in no time. This would mean that they could move on to the next phase of their plan, and that meant that they were one step closer to the mass production they were planning. Nothing like exploiting child labor, guys. Using child slavery to buy Julie, and now she's gonna work for us, and now we're gonna mass produce the figurines for the Coomers to buy. Fucking genius business model. But besides the memes, Julie seems to be growing pretty fast, huh? Not height-wise, but like magic-wise. And if you're young and you learn all this magic at an early age, your mana pool like increases significantly. That's one of like the mechanics in Mushoku Tensei, right? So when Julie grows up later, I don't even know how old she is now. Isn't she going to be like one of the most formidable mages because Rudy has been like teaching her since such a young age? Next phase of their plan, and that meant that they were one step closer to the mass production they were planning. Now, the next part of Rudy's day was lunch, then... Could we mass produce an army? Not just like random figurines for sale for the Coomers, but like an army. An army of these dolls to help us take back Asura Kingdom. Now I'm probably jumping ahead way too much. But like, I mean, we've already talked about moving dolls and imagine if we had an army of those moving dolls that we already saw before, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be kind of crazy? I don't know. His advanced healing and intermediate. You know what I would want to do? I would try to mass produce a bunch of hot dolls and then like I would open up, you know, uh, a, a well-established business where rich people would show up and my, my dolls would, you know, they would um, offer them different types of services and we could make a lot of money like that. I'm thinking of a brothel right now. Immediate detoxification classes. Nenahoshi's experiments were what came next, and it would always be tense as there was this looming sense of irritation and impatience. Six months of magic circles were tested to no avail, so that meant it was time for her to move on to something different. Rudy would then go meet up with Silphie, and it's here we get to the most important thing from this day in the life bit. What is it? Silphie's schedule is unbelievably busy. Only once every three days does she get to spend the night at home, and that was what? only because Alina Lise offered to watch the princess for her. On the days she didn't, Sylphie would have to spend the night at school, and it was before that that she would usually go and walk home first. Didn't even know, because like what we see in the anime episode seems like Sylphie and Rudy just like living together, and I thought Sylphie still had like vacation, but so many times passed. She would finish class, go home and cook dinner, then do some cleaning, take a bath, and go back to school. Damn! This wouldn't be that bad if the house was close, but with the walk being 30 How far minutes is it? at least, 30 I'm minute sure walk? Of travel each day would get rather tired. That's too much fucking commuting. Like, we're fucking using magic. Can we not figure something out? Nah, this is where teleportation would be so easier, right? Imagine if we had a simple fucking teleportation, just, you know, go back to school and the house and blah, blah. Don't we have, like, carriages? No fucking houses? No nothing? Especially with the school, work, and chores in between all that. Rudy, of course, felt the same, but Sylvie's response was that she liked doing all of that. It just made the time they did get to spend together even more special. All right. So it was the nights she spent at home which were about as horny <laughs> as you'd expect, and it eventually got to the point where Rudy yeah. felt guilty for it. He for wanted what? to exercise self-control and not treat her like an object, but Sylphie's express permission would always convince him otherwise. <laughs> I mean, her ears are flapping. This is very cute. <laughs> the ears are fucking flapping. He takes a bite of it. I mean, Sylphie did literally say, please dig in. So it's not like this is not consensual, you know? She but wants it, I guess. Rudy knew he was weak and wanted to show respect, but at the same time, this was everything he'd ever dreamed of. There was a whole list of things he wanted to do or have done to him, so whenever Selfie would give him the go-ahead, he would just... What's the fucking list? Alright, uh, today, Selfie, I you, you're gonna eat my ass. Have you ever ate ass before? Okay, you're gonna try eating my ass today. And then tomorrow, I got like this. Wouldn't anyways. Lose control and forget everything. Wait, 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 so wait, wait, what's so the list? He'd actually been able to complete half his list already. What's the list?! There must be an actual detailed list in the light novel! What is his list?! He obviously didn't do anything Sylphie didn't want him to do, but the lengths she went to make him happy were far greater than the lengths he went for her. 
Hmm. It's the reason he felt the need to make it up to her, leading to their eventual deal to teach each other magic. This happens a bit later on in the episode though, so before that we first need to talk about the day the letter came. It was a morning unlike any other, and Rudy was Paul's lying letter. in bed both horny and happy. <laughs> the bliss of waking up next to someone like Sylphie made him wonder if this was what it was like to be truly happy. And that's the dangerous thing, right? When you're the most happy, everything will just fucking... It'll just slip. We'll just fucking pull it right underneath you, right? It's like this twisted thing in works of fiction where a character reaches their peak happiness. Everything is so perfect. And then everything crumbles. And that's where the peak depression happens. And Mushoku Tensei, the way they do things, especially with the turning points, I'm like, I'm just fucking ready. I am so cautious. I've been just anticipating this from the beginning. And I swear to God, if they fucking don't even... No, they should show the turning point this season, right? We've already waited entirely part one. They have to fucking do it. But when will it be done? Is it going to be somehow like um, middle of the season? Or is it going to be, like, at the very, very end? When was the Mana Disaster? That was, like, part one of season one. When was Turning Point 2? That was, like, a couple episodes before the end. So maybe around, like, episode 20? 21? If, assuming we have, like, episode 13 to 24 to go to? 20-ish? That's what I would anticipate? To him, this is what he felt life was worth living for. So, things had been relatively peaceful, and it was an amazing feeling knowing such a sensation would be experienced every three days now. Amazing. There was one major thing that had happened, though, and that's the shonen-esque sub-story happening within the university. What? You see, unbeknownst to Rudy and his relaxing home life, an image had built around him which he probably wouldn't agree with. This wasn't something he was aware of up until now, but somehow he'd become the boss of the school. Well, yeah, I mean, he fucking, that, that, that bodyguardy episode, right? The bodyguardy episode. Like, no one could be bodyguardy, but Rudy fucking stood up to him and actually kind of like, quote unquote, you know, won that little exchange, right? And everyone saw it. And if, and all the beast people too, right? They know Linnea and Person are like the queens of the school, but they already refer to Rudy as boss. So I thought that everyone already anticipated Rudy to be pretty much like the top dog of the school. He was the leader of the most fearsome group Renoa had ever known, and to all the students they ever come known. to refer to them as this. Rudius' demonic circle of six. Oh, so that's what the circle of six is. It's like our inner faction. This is like if Tensura, you know, Rimuru has the octogram of, you know, the different eight fucking demon lords. Or well, Rudius, we got the circle of six, man. Rudius' demonic circle of six. It was a group very similar to the four heavenly kings, and their ranks consisted of exactly Pretty cool. what you'd expect. The obvious were Xanaba, Cliff, Linnea, and Persena. Then Damn, Cliff is in it, dude! This is kind of a crazy lineup, right? You got the blessed child Xanaba, royal, right? These two beast girls, Linnea and Persena, also are pretty much royalty, right? And they're very strong. Cliff is like an actual genius and has ties to, like, Midas and somehow, like, the Pope, too, right? And the not-so-obvious were Fitz and Bodyguardi. Bodyguardi, literal demon king, and fits the silence, aka Sylphie, who's been using magic incantationless since a young age like Rudy too. All supposedly answered to Rudy and all- uh, No Eddie not easy? No Eddie not easy? What, 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 what? Bodyguardi could join? Uh, Eddie not easy is not allowed to join? It'd be funny if like Julie was involved too, and everyone's like, holy shit, it's the dwarf child Julie. She can out drink Bodyguardi answered to Rudy and all needed to be defeated if anyone wanted to get to him. It's like an elite so four. If someone wanted to challenge Rudy for his control of the school, it was common knowledge now that they first needed to defeat the six. A cursed child, a genius, a royal Oh my bad. I thought I thought Zanova was a blessed child. I thought I thought the strength was a blessing. Is is Zanova an actual cursed child? I thought the difference between I thought Zanova was an example of a blessed child when I was like, holy shit, or Orsted is a cursed child, huh? They're the same? Cursed? Blessing? He was always cursed? Have we ever seen a blessed child? A cursed child is a blessed child. I thought that there was a significant difference between what a cursed child and a blessed child is. Cursed child is basically that, right? You're cursed with these powers that are kind of like... It doesn't really work out in your favor, and people might like be afraid of you, but technically that's what Xanaba's thing is, right? He's super strong, and while doing that, he accidentally crushed his like sibling and killed him, right? So... Blessed child and cursed child are the same. It's just whether the edge's effect is good or bad. 
like negative to themselves or positive to themselves, right? But I, okay, okay. It was common knowledge now that they first needed to defeat the six. A cursed child, a genius, a royal guard, two beast girls, and a demon king. Literal Only demon then king. Only would they have the right to challenge Rudy, and that was an occurrence which Rudy hoped would never happen. I mean, if the person challenging him was strong enough to beat Body Gotti, then that was a separate- Well, not beat, but, you know, he said, say, I'll take on your strongest move, right? ...problem all on its own. Obviously, no one ever got past the first challenge, and it was in cases like that that the person challenging would just end up becoming their subordinate. Like, there was this one first year who, who is randomly this dude? became part of their group, and that was simply because Xanaba had annihilated him in a group. <laughs> annihilated? He was a newcomer who defeated all the other delinquents in his grade, so... I wanna see Xanaba beat the shit out of these kids. Yo, this is fun slice of life. Yo, why are we skipping all this shonen slice of life shit, man? That naturally gave him the confidence to challenge Rudy. Given the rules of the school, though, he first needed to defeat the Six, and that resulted in him challenging Xanaba first. It was a fight that started off closer than you may expect, but one that fizzled out as- Hold the fuck on. Linea. Linea. Yo. Sorry, person that, person that, person that, not linea, person that, person that, that tail. So I always wondered how that tail works. Cause like, when actual girls do cosplays of like, cat girls and dog girls, and the tails are there, you know, they got a plug in, you know? <laughs> but like, to them, it's just like right above the butthole, right? It's like the top part of the butt crack. How does that work? And if they were to go to the bathroom, well, do they even use toilets? They're beast girl. Do they just like piss and shit like a fucking dog outside? I'm actually very interested in them. What is their culture? Do, do they use toilets? How does that work? Off closer than you may expect, but one that fizzled out as soon as the first year started running out of mana. All Xanaba had to do was there's a scene with Ghislaine and Z- What did Ghislaine do? Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. Did Ghislaine, like, take a piss or take a shit in season one and I didn't even notice? In the wild? Wait, what do you mean? Sold out and told them, then it was super easy to close the gap and knock him out. So, that's how Rudy gained a new indirect support, okay. and it was all part of the territory of being the university's boss. This wasn't a power Rudy was necessarily unhappy with, since it made intervening with bullies super easy. All he had to do was tell them to, to show up, then immediately they would and run away. Quagmire! It was Quagmire. something he'd do even if he wasn't the boss, since as long as he lived, Rudy wouldn't allow anyone to harass the weak. It was a core belief that defined who he was in this new life. Right, because he used to get bullied. It was that day that Rudy would receive the letter, and it was in the novels that Paul's guilt would be expressed even more. He felt bad for missing Rudy's 15th birthday, and even more so by the fact he'd be missing Norn and Aisha's 10th. And he doesn't even know we got married, right? Paul has no idea he missed the wedding. He also felt bad for reception his sisters to Rudy since not only did he ask Rudy to just fucking Paul, dude, deadbeat motherfucker, can't do anything by himself, sending his fucking children to us. Nah, I'm being mean to Paul. Paul's trying his best. Take care of them, but he also requested he find a house and even enroll them into school. It was a job Paul knew he should be doing as their father, but one he couldn't since getting Zenith was important too. Yeah, so the idea is like the continent that we're going to save Zenith is like the second most dangerous right behind the demon continent. Can't bring the kids over. So Aisha and Norn are with us now along with Ruizard. So I guess Aisha and Norn will join the school? Aisha, Norn, and Julie is a little bit younger than Aisha and Norn, but would they join Reno and Magic School? Do they even have talent for magic? I straight up don't know what the fuck Norn is good for. I know Aisha. Aisha's smart, right? She's got the street smarts. She's very fast with it. Norn just seems like a... I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna get cancelled for saying this. She seems fucking useless, dude. She seems like a fucking regular child that just complains. And that's based on what we've seen so far. And you know what? A child at that age, I think it makes sense. That's very realistic. But like, is she good at something? We don't know that yet. She's not like a swordsman or a magician that I've seen. What is she good for other than just fucking crying and yelling at Rudy? At the very least, he was confident he could handle that, and he assumed if all went well, he'd be back with her in a year or two. Norn and Aisha's circumstances would then be described in a little more detail, and it was Norn who Paul felt Rudy needed to look out for. Since she wasn't gifted the same way that him or Aisha was, it was only natural that she felt a bit isolated. 
Oh boy, we're gonna go through an entire fucking insecurity arc and she's gonna be lashing out at us and oh my god, this is gonna get frustrating, huh? Next couple episodes with Norn, we're gonna be just frustrated. And I like Aisha. She's always shown her intelligence in season one. She's super fucking fast with it, right? Her wits. She deceives all of us in season one, right? Everyone was like, Norn, like, Aisha doesn't really know who Rudy is, right? But at the very end, Aisha knew from the fucking beginning and basically just like convinced Rudy to save everyone. So like we, already then, we knew exactly how smart she was. Norn, on the other hand, just seems a little useless. Combine that with Paul spoiling her, making her a bit selfish, and there was no doubt that she would prove- Eldad, Paul did this. Paul fucking did this, spoiled her, made her selfish, Eldad. ...to be a bit difficult. This was the contents of what Paul wrote, and it essentially chalks up to Paul feeling bad about everything. Hmm. In any case, the fact Paul needed him to buy a house made Rudy relieved in the fact that he had already bought one. Yeah, we got a mansion. The main concern with having Norn and Aisha live there, though, was the impact on their education that Rudy's nightlife would have on them. So no more fucking... Apparently, random comment I read on a YouTube video, and I'm not sure if this is right, but apparently, out of jealousy, whenever Nanahoshi was staying over, Sophie would, like, moan louder? At night? To like, make her jealous or something? So Sylvia obviously can't do that to Norn and Aisha, right? So I guess Norn and like, we can't fuck anymore. The list of things that Rudy wants, you know, it's just like... <laughs> we need to find a different room. We need to... We need to go find somewhere else and do this shit, bro. <laughs> he figured he would have to put them in the rooms... Is there no, like, what? Come on, we use magic. Like, is there no way that we can have, like, soundproof magic? So anything that happens in Rudy and Sylvia's room... It's soundproofed. No one could hear it. There's also the secret door. Remember the secret passage in the walls, the bricks? It, it was where the, um, the researcher, the owner of this original mansion and the doll was at. Like, what about there? Can we fuck there? Will the, that noise still echo out through the room? Farthest away from his. Now, something I wish the anime included was Rudy's realization that he needed to ask Sylphie first. He knew being a good partner meant consulting on things together, so rather than just state Norn and Aisha were going to live with them, he instead went and asked for permission first. And then Sophie would be like, no. Fuck them kids. I wanna fuck at home. He would present Sophie with the letter in the kitchen, then let her read it before saying anything. At first, she was a bit disappointed the news of their marriage hadn't yet reached him, but that expression quickly turned serious as soon as she was finished. It wasn't because the letter had mentioned anything particularly concerning, but it did remind Sylphie of her own parents. She was faced once again with the fact that they weren't around anymore, and Aww. the remembrance of that clearly showed via the concern on her face. Rudy would then apologize for being so insensitive, but Sylphie would reassure him by saying she had a new family now. There was oh. no need for her to be unhappy what? since being lonely wasn't something she needed to worry about anymore. It was this that made her Well, so far, and every time something says she's like, oh, I'm so happy, you won't just like disappear on me one day, right? Surely you wouldn't just like disappear. Surely turning point three wouldn't just like, you know, port us to a random place, right? 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 Want to start a family with her even more now, and that brought up the question of whether they were even ready to have a kid. You think my parents would be happy if, if they showed up and found their grandkids waiting? And then Sophie mentioned the possibilities of a concubine, because apparently elves are bad at conceiving children. Is this where Eris shows up? How is this gonna work? Will Eris show up? Or are we gonna expand the harm? Who would our concubine be? The only girl interest so far that Rudy's been romantically involved in is Sophie and Eris. And Eris? I think it makes sense. She's been gone for so long. Maybe? I don't know. Rudy was sure things would be fine if they did, since if every other living thing was capable of having one, then there was no reason that he- Oh, you're right. There is Roxy. I forgot, I forgot. There, there is Roxy. She is the OG shrine member. Eris and Roxy. Eris and Roxy. Personal linea. Everybody. Everybody can just join our fucking uh, Nanahoshi. I don't know if Nanahoshi and Rudy, do they? Maybe? Nanahoshi, if she had a child, there's no way she'd be able to leave here, right? Nanahoshi's only thing goal is to basically go back home. There's no way she'd become pregnant and stay here, right? He and Sylphie couldn't handle it either. Besides, with Paul planning to show up with Lilia and Zenith, 
there would be plenty of capable adults present to help raise his kids. Sure. This brings Ideally. us now to Rudy and Sylphie's magic lessons, which as we saw went well for Sylphie, but not so much for Rudy. Sylphie was learning the fundamentals relatively quickly, while Rudy was making pretty much no progress at all. To give a bit more context on why that is, since healing magic required using your own mana to alter the flow of another person's mana. Apparently, according to some kind of YouTube comment, they told me Rudy wasn't able to use healing magic like this incantationlessly because he fundamentally doesn't know what healing is. He just doesn't understand what healing is. And I was like, uh, okay? Anna, perhaps Rudy was just unable to envision that. Perhaps he couldn't conjure the feeling of someone else's mana interfering with his own, and perhaps that was the reason he couldn't silently heal or use any other type of support magic. I just thought that at, at a certain point, right, being able to incantationless everything is fucking busted. And the fight against Orsted, Orsted specifically mentioned when he pretty much just like crushed Rudy's lung so that Rudy couldn't, you know, speak or just like move. Orsted was like, yo, you can incantationless. Why don't you just heal your lung? And obviously at that point was like, man, if he really could, that would be fucking OP, right? So from that perspective, it's like Rudy cannot incantationless heal because it's too busted and we need to nerf him. But aside from that, plot wise, why can he actually not use incantationless healing magic? And people are saying he just can't understand what healing other person is. I don't know what As that means. Selfie? Disturbed magic was something Rudy wanted her to keep a secret. He told her who it was he had learned it from, but didn't tell her how he almost died while doing so. There it is. So, that scene right there. That Orsted might not like the distribution of this magic. Rudy warned Sylphie not to teach it to anyone. Wait, wait. The disturbed magic, right? We're talking about disturbed magic. Hold up. What are we talking about? Magic was something Rudy wanted her to keep a secret. He. I thought disturbed magic was a common thing. Didn't Rudy learn this shit while like walking to the school with Eddie Narizze, just training on random shit across the road? And then he actually used disturbed magic onto Sylphie the first time they met, right? I didn't realize this is such like a, a secret magic. He told her who it was he had learned it from, but didn't tell her how he almost died while doing so. Is this really not common? Huh. Yeah, so he saw Orsted use it on him. And then he picked it up. So like... Really? This is like super rare magic. I thought everyone kind of knew about this and wasn't so like special, but okay. So, out of fear that Orsted might not like the distribution of this magic, Rudy warned Sylphie not to- Would Orsted get mad? Would the Orsted get mad? I don't know. I don't think so. War game and the winner would get to do in bed whatever they wanted to the loser. All right, tonight, I'm getting the wooden strap on, Rudy. Get ready for this. Now, what they keep skipping all this shit. The list of things that Rudy and Sylphie wants to do to each other. Rudy would then bring up the topic of having kids again, and this okay. would turn the conversation horny for both of them. You're probably best not knowing the cringy stuff Rudy says after. I want to know! It just is that Rudy treats sex like an H game. Well... What do you mean? Like an ace game, what do you- Well, he is a master of those visual novels back at home, right? Sometimes, anyway. You can read the rest on- Several months has passed since we got married. We had a healthy, healthy S life. It was a bit crude to say this, but the moment I pulled the trigger on my magnum- <laughs> Yeah, I wonder what the magnum is. I would shout phrases straight out of an Edo game. Things like, GET PERGNANT! <laughs> And the like. There wasn't really a deep meaning behind the word. I just wanted to try saying them in real life instead of a video game. Bro just wanted to be a hentai hero. He wanted to be the main character of a visual novel where every character he meets, he has to inseminate them. So he wanted to say stuff like, Get pregnante. Yes, my magnum's making you pregnante. You will spit up 3,000 children for me. That is kind of cringe. On screen here, but now I'm just going to move on to the next part. All right. It was one month after the letter that the incident with Nanahoshi would happen, but before we get to the breakdown itself, there's a bit more to be said about the theory of how all this works. Okay, we'll talk about the breakdown when Annie just talks about it. Obviously, the bigger and more complex the object you try to summon, the more mana required to make it happen. This is the way the conservational laws of energy work in this world, and if it rained true with this experiment here, the amount of energy being used for this would only result in a 1 meter teleportation incident. Damn. That is, if the experiment grew out of control anyway. That's crazy! And all this just for one meter, and what did this do? Sent us to the fucking demon continent. Really makes you wonder what that pool of mana was on the sky that 
black sun looking thing. Something that could be compared to Demon God Laplace. But Rudy also is compared to Demon God Laplace in terms of his mana quantity, which I thought was very fascinating. And I think I've been saying this shit. I haven't said this shit in a while. I used to say this shit all the time back in the season two, part one, you know, reactions is Rudy is the cause of the mana disaster because that ball of mana only existed after Rudy came into the village and stayed for a long time. I think it makes sense that while he was developing here and learning, he was subconsciously adding on to the mana up uh, above and then it triggered. Maybe that isn't right, but it just seems like something that could be possible. If that's not possible, then the mana has to be some different source that we don't really know about. And that wouldn't really be like a fun twist. I think what would be a really fun twist is since the mana disaster pretty much started everything, it's like the beginning domino. And if Rudy was the one responsible for it, I think that would be a very, I don't know, it, it, it would be a cool story to tell, you know what I mean? Your teleportation incident. That is if the experiment grew out of control anyway. Even if it somehow did through all of Nanahoshi's safety precautions, Rudy was certain he'd be able to find his way back anyway. He wasn't nearly as concerned about being teleported again as you might think he should be, even going so far as to joke about it. Please Nanahoshi contact my family. <laughs> the they don't exist. Her circle too, but because Rudy didn't understand it from his perspective, that meant we didn't get to either. So, the experiment would start and fail just like how we saw in the anime, then Nanahoshi would erupt and have her breakdown. The anime only alluded to the idea okay. of self-harm or worse, but the novel straight up confronts it and brings it to the forefront. The knife the as well, yeah? It parallels the mental state between her and Rudy's and clearly describes the impact that it has on him. Yes, this is a very deep scene and Rudy could empathize, right? But before this happened, all I saw was a girl raging like she was in the COD lobby, just smashing her fucking keyboard. And I was laughing, right? And I was laughing, but then I caught myself. And I was like, when I saw Nana Hoshi looking like this, I was like, okay, this is not funny anymore. But it's crazy, the kind of freaks on both ends of the spectrum that fans of Mushoku Tensei has, right? So basically, on one spectrum, if you watch Mushoku Tensei, you're a fucking terrible person. This is Pedro Tensei. You're going you're gonna to go to hell, right? There's that spectrum. And then the complete other spectrum is, oh my god, I can't believe you laughed at Nana Hoshi crying and screaming in tears like that. You are a terrible person. And I'm like, I can never fucking win. I thought that she was funny. If you look at the comments of my video, many people are like, that's such a memeable scene. Nana Hoshi's just raging. I even acknowledge after that saying, yeah, that was kind of funny in the beginning until I realized that this is an actual mental fucking breakdown and not just like a comedic moment. But it's just crazy how like sensitive people are or like for like basically like these like fictional characters to the point where they're willing to like send out personal insults by saying like, oh my God, you laughed at Nanaoshi crying and you laughed when Rudy didn't get, couldn't get his dick up and got, you know, slapped by Sarah and left. I always knew there was something wrong with you. And I'm like, I'm reading these comments and I'm like, bro, it's not that deep. It's just fucking anime. But these like freaks on both sides of the spectrum are so terminally online that if you just watch something or if you have the wrong opinion about a fictional show, they're willing to insult somebody personally with, through this anonymous interface known as social media. It's, it's fucking crazy, dude. Even the erectile dysfunction thing, right? Last season, like the Mushoku Tensei fans are just so scattered. Most people I think can recognize that the erectile dysfunction thing is pretty funny. But some people take it so fucking personally because they might also suffer from it. And they're like, you don't fucking understand a thing about ED. And I'm like, yeah, I don't. I guess you can, man. Sent clearly describes the impact that it has on him. The anime didn't do too great showing this in the infirmary, but the face we see here is the face he had then too. His lips were parched and breathing heavy, and Zanaba himself even stated how he'd never ever seen Rudy this flustered before. I think this would have done well to hammer home just how serious this situation was to Rudy, and it would have made clear how easily a reminder of his past could affect him. Another significant portion the anime left out with Rudy was the responsibility he displayed while taking care of Nanahoshi. You see, Sylvie Such had actually as? shown up to see what was happening here. She overheard students talking about Rudy carrying a girl, then rushed over to the infirmary to see what was happening. Was Sylvie jealous? Was Sylphia ready to kill Nanahoshi to protect, you know, her husband? It was then that Rudy would ask if Nanahoshi could stay with them, which was a question no. Sylphie would respond to by asking why. Since to her, staying in the infirmary was probably better, Sylphie couldn't understand why Rudy would push for otherwise. 
and then at night when we brought Nana Hoshi over, Sophie would Sophie would moan extra loud so that Nana Hoshi could hear. This wasn't because she was suspicious Rudy would do anything, but it was more so just because she didn't know how to handle Nana Hoshi. So if Nana Hoshi really was going to stay with them, then Sophie made it clear that she would be Rudy's responsibility. Okay. Now. It was on the way to the house that Rudy truly contemplated Nanahoshi's life, and it was while doing so that he understood how everything led up to this. You see, he could tell from carrying her just how light she was, and that made it clear that she wasn't eating enough. Her commitment to her work meant the potato she probably didn't so socialize, and if her only focus was to get back home, then the stress of not making progress was likely agonizing. It was all this that was constantly bubbling to the surface, and the breaking point was the recent failure killing two years of research. It was a fatal blow that had made her last six years worthless. The circumstances were six definitely years different of investment, the man. he had been through in his own life, but the mental anguish was all the same for sure. If he had to compare it to something he went through himself, though, a similar setback was the time he'd been banned from a video game. What? He'd spent several years no liking this one online game. He got banned in a video game when we're using this to basically compare the amount of time investment we put in for fucking nothing at the end. Like Nana Hoshi, wait, what game? To one day get banned and lose. Everything. Would you? Would you do? The entire day he wasn't able to process anything, and when he realized nothing he could do would get it back. Was he playing World of Warcraft? Did he buy gold? Did he RMT? Did he? What, what was he doing? How did he get banned? The next month he had spent unmotivated to do anything. It was a learning experience in which Rudy vowed to never touch an online game again. What now, online game was it? This definitely wasn't the same, but whether the pain from this or the trauma from his bully- Yeah, you can't really directly compare uh, getting banned in a fucking video game and feeling like your life is useless compared to someone that's stuck in a different world trying to research for six fucking years and realizing that their research culminated to nothing and that she feels hopeless and can't get out. Not really the same, but the core theme is investing a lot of time into something and then suddenly you're just cut off. Everything is just gone and you question, did I just waste the last X amount of years? The depression which arose from it was something Rudy was all too familiar with. I felt like this in my first YouTube anime reaction channel what I, what I had to actually delete my own channel for the sake of the future of YouTube because that's when I had two copyright strikes. And if you get three, and I didn't know you could counter appeal and stuff, and I also didn't have much ground to stand against it because we were doing full visual reaction with no audio. I had to make a decision. It's like, shit, I spent a year of my life pouring everything I have after work into this thing. And finally, there's some flicker of life. And then I get hit with the copyright strikes. And then I had to fucking kill it myself. Now, it sounds fucking stupid, right? It's a YouTube channel. Like, get over it. It's nothing. It, no, no one's dying. But to me, I invested everything. So much emotion, time, and energy. The sacrificing everything else in my life just for the pursuit of this one thing. And then I had to kill it myself. That I can relate with. That was some depressing shit. It had allowed him to relate to Nana Hoshi on a far more personal level. This brings us to when Nana Hoshi is finally at their house, and while the anime showed Sylphie to be the one to find the knife, it was actually Rudy since Sylphie wasn't even around for any of this. This presents a slightly different message from the anime, since by Rudy being the sole caretaker of Nana Hoshi, it shows the level of responsibility he's willing to take to ensure she makes it through all this. It highlights the extent to which he resonates with what she's going through, and shows a more empathetic side that we don't usually get to see. I think the same thing happened, the last thing similar thing happened like this, when Rudy was able to relate to something from his past life and get super serious, was Julie, right? When we were getting Julie, what did Rudy say? It's, didn't he even offer to like kill Julie to basically put her out of her misery? Because he could relate to like the despair that she's in and like how hopeless things seem. So if you wanted like a quick merciful way out that I would offer, I remember that scene. This is all because her pain reminded him of his own and to see it all from beginning to end, well, it was hard not to see his old self in her. So, a whole week would go by with Nenahoshi staying at Rudy's, and aside from eating and sometimes showering, very little agency sometimes was showering. on her part. Stinky. Her ambition was gone and in its place resignation. It was one day while Rudy was watching over her, though, that out of nowhere Nenahoshi would suddenly start talking again. 
Oh. She would describe the circuit board she was trying to create and lament over how no matter how much she changed the wiring, this one right. part just wouldn't connect to the rest. And that's where Cliff the comes to the rescue. Cause defects, and a patch in that defect would just create another defect. So, like a software engineer trying to debug their code, <laughs> Nenahoshi would be stuck in an endless loop of non-stop bug fixing. Okay. She simply couldn't solve the problem of connecting this one circuit to another. Rudy would just listen silently as Nenahoshi said her piece, and that's when he would decide to bring the others in. It's a scene that I actually want to delve into more circles. because there's a theory in it, but one that'll unfortunately have to be in the next video. Mm. They kind of speed Part through two video coming. success and the party after, so that's something that I'll have to talk about later. I like this new style of Annie's video, where he'll basically cover it, and then it's like, there's this one specific thing that I need to spend more time on, that's going to be a part two video. He did the same thing last time with Shoko Tensei with the Luke versus Rudy fight. If you enjoyed what you saw in this video, though, then I did. Sure to leave a like and consider. Y'all know what to do. Please go to Mr. Anonymous' channel, like his video, because he always gives such good breakdowns on what's going on. And that's pretty cool just to see. I, I, I think the coolest thing or like the funniest thing is the, the six demon circles right, that are shown in like Elite Four that Rudy has, as well as. The list of naughty things that Rudy wants to do to Sophie and vice versa. Surprised they skipped it. I think it would be for really fun content when everything is just so kind of chill and relaxed and more slice of life. But it is what it is. And I will see you on the next Annie News video with the part two of this. Bye bye.